Actually, before yeah, before you disappear, I wanted to do yes. like to wish happy birthday to our TAs. They were born the same day, so they oh, have wow. okay. remind us one <laughs> <laughs> one time less. Amazing. All right, all right. So good luck with okay. your presentation on the other side, and I keep I keep here the the audience uh, enjoyed. All right. Bye. Okay, great. Take care, everyone. <laughs> all right. Bye bye. Okay, okay, so uh, back to us, and I guess I'll keep uh, from, well, I'll restart uh, basically from the first slide that we covered today. Uh, and so let me share the screen. So yeah, both both TAs uh, have the same birthday. Uh, yeah, there was, <laughs> there was a birthday criteria to select them, perhaps, so we don't have to, again, keep in mind too many things. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> It's not the first time. Also, in my previous lab, we had four of us had two birthdays, right? My birthday was the same as my co-worker and my ad previous advisor birthday was the same as, as another co-worker. So this thing is kind of more common than you think. All right. All right. So getting back to actual lecture class, right? Le lecture topic, class topic, whatever. Uh, so do, what do we talk about today? And Today we're going to be talking about, uh, again, see, yes, deep learning, but we start with convolutional networks, right? Why do I talk about convolutional net? Uh, because, okay, last last lesson uh, with Jan last week, we, we started with recurrent neural networks. I was thinking to restart, uh, to, to tell, tell you more about the recurrent neural net today. Uh, I think I'm going to push that to tomorrow, since what Jan talked today is really, really connected to what I'm going to be uh, digging further in this lab, right? So I think it's making more sense for me to, uh, for you actually to, to listen, to hear more about the same uh, topic, right? So we don't get too confused. Um, so convolutional neural net, what do they do? They basically exploit the station stationarity, locality and compositionality of the natural data. This is what uh, the first slide uh, of today's lesson with Jan was about, right? And so he uh, went perhaps a little bit fast on these three concepts. We are going to be building now some uh, deeper intuition and understanding of what they actually mean. Okay. Okay. So can I click here, Benny? Okay, fantastic. So input layer or input samples. What is what are these uh, input data we use uh, can be used for uh, convolutional net, right? What kind of data is effective for being fed to a convolutional neural net. So usually until now, we have seen that our data points are those curly, sorry, those uh, pink X bold vectors, right? So when they are bold, this, this, this guy over here. So if they are bold, they means it's a vector for me. And so I have that the ith vector X belongs to Rn. So it's a column vector uh, of N components. And this is bold because it's a vector. And so the set, so this is curly brackets, means the set of all the xi's uh, of n components such that xi is a data sample is going to be my curly x, right? And so my curly x is the collection of training sample or of sample right, that I have access to, okay? In this case, uh, they are m. So my data set, my training data set has m, comp m, m uh, samples, uh, one to m, with, where each of these can be thought, again, uh, these vectors can be thought as a vector going from the zero with the arrow, or you also can think about that as the point in this one point in this n-dimensional space, okay? But we can also think about uh, some other type of data, which are a little bit, uh, you know, different from this. So these are the input samples, right? So we can also think about the following, right? So my curly X instead right now are those made of the set of these X I's, which again are this kind of uh, items, but X I's are functions now. Okay. And so these functions, uh, they go from this big Omega here, capital Omega to RC. Uh, so the omega is the domain and RC is the image or codomain, okay? And basically this function are mapping my uh, lowercase omega vector to a lowercase uh, bold x, right? So it goes from vector uh, omega, which it belongs to capital omega, to the x, which is belonging to RC. 
<clears throat> and of course, uh, this is a function, right, of the omega. And I have how many how many functions? I have m functions, right? Or with i that goes one to, from one to m. So what is this omega? Omega is called the domain. So it's my signal domain. So x, uh, this one over here, is called a signal. And the signal has a specific domain, the omega, right? Uh, instead, RC, these are the uh, number of, so C stays for channel, okay? Uh, and therefore, the signals X, I map my domain omega to the number of channels RC. Okay, okay. So, first question, what is this omega, right? So, what am I talking about? Why do, I, why do we need this, right? So, we need this because... Uh, if you try to just treat an image as one data point in like, a, let's say let you have a one megapixel image, right? A grayscale one megapixel image. So this means we are in a one million dimensional space, right? And you have one data point in one million dimensional data space. As I told you before, another data point is gonna be very close to that one. And a third data point is gonna be very, very, very close to that one. And so everything is very, very crammed together. And uh, it's really hard to, I would say it's, I would even say it's impossible to train a, a fully connected layer, fully connected network. Uh, well, it's also called multi-layer perceptron, but we don't like this word. It's impossible to train a fully connected uh, network to, to perform you know, anything on this type of uh, data because it's way too crazy to move, to, to operate in this million dimensional space. Because as I told you, we had to go in a higher dimensional intermediate representation. And if you start with a million dimensions, <laughs> where do you go? Okay, it's, it's not feasible in terms of computations, I think. And also in terms of number of samples that are required in order for you to train the system. Um, because the number of samples is proportionally increasing with the number of dimensions that are uh, uh, you're dealing with. Okay, so the, uh, I'm gonna be getting there. Okay, I'm answering this question in a second. Okay, so what is so instead of having just thinking about images as a data point, we want to think about an image as a function. Okay, which uh, in this in this kind of context is instead of being calling a function, we're going to call, we, we are going to be calling it a signal. And so a signal gives us some information on top of this domain. So there is a domain and on top of this domain, the signal will give us, you know, some information, which is this R channel. And this is like, um, uh, I call it a descriptive information. So for every location in the Omega, right? So Omega is our domain. For every location, the signal will tell us what is the specific information, characteristic information of that location of our domain, okay? So what is this domain, okay? All right, let, let's try to give you a few examples. So Omega could be uh, the set, the order set of the uh, going from one, two, three, blah, 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 until capital T divided by delta T, okay? So let's say uh, I have a sequence that is uh, the last three seconds. And perhaps I want to, I have a delta T, which is going to be 0 0.1 or 100 milliseconds, right? So the frequency, uh, the sampling frequency is like uh, 10 Hertz, okay? And so overall, this uh, set here goes from one to three and four until 30. And I start from one because I, that's how I count in mathematics. I count one, two, three, right? If we do Python programming, we count from zero or C programming. So my omega here is like a, uh, like um, it has discrete values, okay? It's not 1.2, 1.4. This is only one, two, three. It's like an index. You cannot go in between. So it exists at, you know, discrete intervals. And I have a finite number of elements. So this is a first uh, type of signal, right? And capital T is the total amount of time of the total length of this signal, which could be like the 30, um, like the three seconds I was mentioning you that we perhaps do like some prediction uh, for with a predictive model. I don't know, this is something we're gonna be seeing in the future, or it could be a audio signal. Like I want to listen to three minutes of 
of, of sound, right? And then the frequency, the um, delta T could be like, let's say, uh, 1 over 20 kilohertz, okay? That's usually a possible uh, frequency, sampling frequency. Or 44, I think. Now we use 44 kilohertz uh, sam uh, frequency, sampling frequency for audio. Uh, and delta T is the sampling interval, right? One over the sampling frequency. So we figure now what is the, uh, this omega, right? The omega is the discrete index. We can index our signal, right? So we have X of lowercase omega and then omega, lowercase omega tells us uh, like a point. Like this can be also thought as a chain, right? You have one item after each other or like a one dimensional grid uh, what is C uh, in this case? So if we are talking about, let's say, audio, we can have the following. So if it's one, uh, can you guess what is going to be the audio signal which has only one channel? What's called? You should be typing in the chat. It's a mono. Yeah, that's correct. So this is a mono signal, a mono type of signal. Uh, instead, if I have two channels given a specific sample, what is called that? Some, okay, stereo. Someone else can, anke, also, can also <laughs> answer, okay? Uh, so yeah, that's definitely stereo. So someone that is not the same person here, can someone guess what is the five plus one? Yeah, <laughs> what is 1.1? Yes, okay, fine. Uh, can we explain in English perhaps so that I understand whether you are following? Maybe we know already. Is it two? Okay, five channel plus five subwoofer. No, one subwoofer, right? Uh, yeah, one one subwoofer. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so that's basically the Dolby five point one. Okay, okay, all right. So this is uh, this type of signals are said to be one dimensional because the domain has only one direction. Okay, and that's called one dimensional signal. One, not two. One. Okay. All right, so moving on, we can have this type of uh, omega, right? This different type of domain. Uh, in this case, we have the Cartesian, Cartesian product of two discrete sets, okay? These are order sets, but okay. Um, so you have one, two, three, four, H and uh, times, right? So it's, a, it's a, like an uh, outer product, one, two, three, four, until W, no? And so as you can guess, H stands for height and W stands for width, okay? So in this case, we don't have the unitary grid, but we have a 2D grid, right? The classical grid. Uh, and these are images, right? And so, yeah, correct. So let's see what C can be. So again, number one, what is it? Someone that didn't talk so far. Please talk back to me. I know it's early. Oh, I don't know if it's early. Grayscale, okay, very good. Someone spells with the A, someone spells with the E. Okay, I prefer it British. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, it's not black and white. Uh, it would be black and white if the channel would be actually N, right? So you have binary zero or one. So you actually you would have like uh, zero or one to the one, right? In this case, I've, I've written here R. And so R is going to be like all continuous values. So in this case, it would be grayscale. Uh, we would have to replace this R with a, a set zero and one. Then you would have black and white image. Okay. If black and white means uh, uh, salt and pepper, right? Like the the, the binary image, right? Bit, bitmap. Okay. So that's correct. Uh, grayscale uh, with number three. I guess you RGB. Okay, you know, but okay, okay. And so. And then 20 is something also Jan talked today, right? I mean, don't cheat and check the slides before <laughs> following the class, right? So they have to guess that. that so the guessing part in the, in the class is part of the learning, right? So the fact that you're not, not cheating on the <laughs> watching the slides that are already online, uh, you, you actually can have like some better uh, absorption of the material, okay? And so these are the hyperspectral images, yes. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. I was skipping the, this one. Okay. Let me click further for these are the hyperspectral images. And so these 20 bands are not, um, are not necessarily, uh, a set. They are actually order. Like Jan said before, they are a set. 
they, they are not ordered. This number of channels actually in the hyperspectral images usually they are, and you know, the lambda, the length, the wavelength are sorted such that you can move from one end to the other of the spectra. Uh, and they go, yeah, outside the, the, the visual field, right? So, so that you can see all types of radiation or spectral radiations. And these are very useful, for example, whenever you have satellite imaging in order to identify regions of desertification or, you know, potential fires and things, because each specific type of uh, soil or, you know, uh, ground type will have a very particular footprint, right? The, the, the spectral footprint, uh, which it's not that evident uh, when you actually um, just use the color information, right? So given that we have sensors that are uh, having like a, a input range that is much larger than our, you know, retina and our, our visual system, we can leverage that larger spectra in order to capture more, you know, meaningful uh, radiation patterns or even albedo, right? The albedo is the reflection of the, of the light from the sun. Okay, uh, the color image, right? I, I actually uh, skipped the, the thing in between. So let me give you even a little bit more uh, precise, uh, you know, uh, understanding or explanation of what's going on, right? So my X, my bold X, right? The, this, this body over here. So this is a bold X, means it's a vector, has a vectorial output. Uh, in this case, it's going to be three components. It's a function of the location W1 and W2. W1 and W2 can only take di discrete values, and namely W1 can take values such as 1, 2, 3, until H, and then W2 can take values in a 1, 2, blah, blah, until W, right? And so the width, uh, W and omega, they are two different letters, okay? Uh, you need to put this curly thing in bit before, otherwise you don't understand what's going on. All right, so these are, you know, just specifying a location in these two D metrics. And then given the 2D uh, location, you're going to be having like a vectorial, like a, uh, like a vector of three components specifying the uh, value of the R channel, right? The green channel and the blue channel. So the right R channel is going to be a scalar field, is a, uh, like a one-dimensional uh, function. The, the image is a one-dimensional, one right? The image, like the codomain is one-dimensional. One G, the same. This is a basically a grayscale image, right? It has one channel and the B is also one channel. But then if you put them together, you can have like the purple and the like, pinkish and the purple color, high, right? Here are the, my background, okay? Cool. Um, so we have one more, and which is this one, right? And so in this case, the domain is the real axis, R4 times R4, right? So it's like a whatever space. You, I cannot even draw it and think about that. Uh, what are these? Do, you, do we know? Do we have physicists in class? So these are simply the time space time. And the other one is the four momentum. Okay, so this we are talking about physics. So here we can use convolutional network in order to play with physics. And we can a bit try, for example, to uh, predict the, let's say, Hamiltonian of the system. Okay. 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 So we can do fancy things here. And this is like the type of data we, uh, can use convolutional network for, you know, getting actual, you know, uh, stuff to work. Right. So, and le let's actually go start simple and let's say how this 1D signal work. Right. So this 1D signal, I sometimes also write it as like a lowercase x uh, with square bracket. And inside there is this k, which is my indexing uh, variable, right? Which should have been the omega in the previous slide. And again, this is gonna be, can also be considered like this big long vector of these specific items happening at specific locations, right? And so there is no intermediate value. Okay, okay, okay. So we mentioned that we can apply neural nets, or convolutional net, if the data has some specific property. And we are going to be covering this right now. So once again, the 1D type of signal are those in which the domain is uh, one dimensional, right? So uh, R to the, like, sorry, the, the omega has like just in, goes in one direction. And so this could be like, for example, the waveform here uh, in the first example. The second case, we have like a grid that goes in two directions. 
And so the still discrete values and by we go in two directions. So it's a two dimensional image, a two dimensional type of signal. And the third one is a one dimensional signal where our each item in the sequence, it's corresponding to this X1, X2, X3, which are very long vectors. And let's say these are, so each of these X1, X2, and X3 are 10 dimensional, 10,000 dimensional vectors. Uh, representing the index in a dictionary, representing where the specific word happened to be. Okay, so John maybe is the blah uh, word in a given dictionary. So the collection of these indexes can also be uh, thought as you know a signal that operates on, in one dimension. Okay, so let's focus now on the on the first signal, the, the the one that goes in one dimension, and it is represented here with a waveform. So this waveform here, let, let's zoom it a little bit. So on the first part, I can see this specific pattern happening on the early part of the signal. Okay, later on in the same signal, I will also see the same type of pattern. So this is one characteristic uh, of this type of signals, these natural signals, is that uh, similar type of patterns happen over, over, over again, okay? So patterns are happening in different locations of the signal, the same type of pattern. Uh, moreover, let's zoom it a little bit. Yeah, there we go. So question for people at home. If I see a peak on the left-hand side, how likely is that I see a peak coming up quickly? Or if I can quantify this better, how likely is that a peak happened very quickly after a first peak rather than further away or even further? Or what about what is the likelihood that given that I have a peak on the left hand side, there is a peak there or even further, further away? So we can tell that, you know, perhaps if I say a word, a word is made like a, of a sound, uh, and this sound, which is called uh, like there are phonemes that are attached together. If I want to say a specific word, like the word word, uh, it has actually one type of structure. And this structure, if I say multiple times, will always be, you know, having this information condensed in that specific temporal interval. Okay. It can be a bit larger, slower, depending on how fast I say the word. Uh, but again, as you, as you figure, I said this specific word so many times that it appears several times uh, in the overall temporal information, the temporal domain. And then the actual uh, likelihood that you find a specific phoneme after another phoneme is very high, right? Like very close together in time. But then afterwards, if I say something else over here, it's quite decorrelated by the fact that I have this specific pattern happening over here. Nevertheless, you observe the same pattern over and over again. And then there is some type of local structure that uh, is in the signal. Okay. So there are two things over. What I was trying to say is that, again, the information has a strong correlation in uh, local uh, regions, and then it happens again and again. This does not only happen for the audio type of signal, as I show you right now but also for the uh, second type, the, the two dimension, right? So let's look at this little kind uh, cute kitty here and let's zoom it uh, like in the central region. And then you have like, ah, a monster. No, it's huge. Okay. All right. So in this type of image, uh, in this type of sorry, signal, you also can see now the discrete locations, right? So these are called pixels. In the other case with the audio, they are called samples, but they're the same thing, right? Uh, like in 3D type of data signals, you're going to have them called voxels. But again, all of these different names are just saying that there is a unit element, uh, like the, the, the value associated to the unit element in the domain, right? So the first point was that let's figure, let's look at this, you know, crevice or whatever this type of um, pattern we have by uh, next to the eye. We can observe that that type of pattern, it's similar to this other one that happened also further away. Again, again, we can see that similar patterns reoccur across the domain. In this case, it's two-dimensional domain, right? 
uh, over and over again, right? So we have this property that I'm going to be called it uh, stationarity, okay? So stationarity is that the same pattern hope happen again and again in the same type of, or in, some, in the same domain, right? Over the domain. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, the other property we were mentioning is the fact that, so how likely is that given the center of the pupil is black, you're going to be also finding another pixel nearby that is also black. I would say it's quite likely uh, you have a high you know, degree of probability. Right? You have a high degree of likelihood that you're going to find another black pixels in the pupil, right? In the, in the hole of your eye, uh, because all the pixels within the pupil are, you know, not reflecting the light. Otherwise you wouldn't see anything, right? So it's a hole and the light goes inside the hole. You don't see anything because there is like a chamber behind, right? Uh, nevertheless, if you move further away from the pupil, no, from, from the hole, uh, and you move to the iris, then you're actually going to see, you know, there is some color behind, uh, like nearby the, the, the pupil, right? So it's less likely that also the iris is black. Could be if you have black irises, you know, you could also have that a high, pro like it can be the same color. But now let's take a step even further, right? So that's completely outside the, the ocular area. And the likelihood to find another black pixels, unless you have a black cat, <laughs> it, it, it's rather low, okay? And the further you go, the further away you go, and the, and the less likely you're gonna find some, you know, uh, likely similar value, right? Or you have, yeah. So again, the information has some, uh, the information in the signal happen to have like local, kind of uh, property has a locality and then the similar type of patterns happen again 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 over the domain and that's the stationarity so we need the third property right uh, let's see who remembers that so um, i don't know if you had breakfast or not but here i'm going to be showing you some donuts okay so here there are many many donuts uh, there are the chocolate there are with the strawberries there is uh, some with the um, uh, what's called the blueberry and etc Okay, so uh, exercise for the for the those of you in class who wear glasses. Okay, so you you can raise your hand so I can actually see that. Uh, how many of you, if you should raise your hand, how many of you uh, wear glasses? I see a few people. Okay, just six people. What about? So everyone has a perfect sight. No, okay. So ten people. Okay, twelve. Fantastic. Okay, now those people that are wearing glasses, please take off your glasses and look at, your, at the screen once again. Now you can also, okay. Uh, you can also react with that. Oh, usually this works very nice in class. Yes, okay. Uh, among the people that don't wear glasses, do you know what's going on here? No. <laughs> okay. Oh, very good. Okay. So someone please explain who cannot see <laughs> what's going on here. Uh, so if you squint, if you, again, if you don't wear glasses, but you squint your eyes, you know, just squint a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's Marilyn Monroe. Okay. Uh, you squinted. Very good. Okay. Okay. So this is third part, right? So this is composition, compositionality. The, the, the part that, uh, if you, if you, if you look at very close, like close by, you don't see any specific type of uh, major structure. Uh, as you start, you know, gathering and integrating the information, uh, in this case, especially, you will be obtaining some, you know, structure, like some, some meaning out of these individual specific values. Okay. And so, as we can see here, there is a high local or go back at a distance, yes. Or just remove your glasses if you're blind like myself. Again, here you can clearly see there are like, uh, like there are very many chocolate, uh, uh, what's called this stuff, I forgot the name, not donuts. Are these donuts or, <laughs> let's call them donuts. I don't think they are, they are bagels, right? The bagels or donuts, whatever. They look some, someone like, look like donuts, some like bagel. But anyhow, you have like chocolate, uh, uh, Oh, someone see the lips of the face. Okay, very good. So the, the lips of the face are those pinkish one, the red one, right? So these are like strawberry donuts. 
And you can see, you know, the fact that you have a strawberry donut here will determine that will have likely a very high likelihood the fact that other strawberry donuts will follow. Okay. Similarly here, you have, you know, a brown a chocolate donut. You have many chocolate donuts nearby. Um, but the far you go and the less likely you're going to find similar donuts. Okay. And then if you put all together uh, this information by, you know, integrating over the spatial domain or just going further away and, and squinting your face, uh, your, your eyes, you can see how the overall local structure can give you a overall uh, understanding of the entirety, right? Uh, and so when you say, when you say, oh, this is a face of a, 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 of a, of a lady, that, that's the whole entirety of the togetherness of all this specific local information that gives you that kind of uh, overall uh, cumulative information. Okay. Everyone can lower your hands. You still have your hands up. It's going to be, you know, the blood is going to be going down <laughs> your arm. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, okay. So moving forward, um, we have already seen how fully connected layers work in the just last lesson. So I'm going to be skipping this part. Uh, and then I'm going to be going directly to the, uh, okay, maybe I can just, just show you the slide. So this was how we compute these uh, specific values, right? You remember that uh, this animation from last time, right? So we have that each neuron here, uh, look at every other neuron, uh, before, uh, and these weights are used in order to weigh the input neurons, right? So given a specific neuron here, the, the first one here, this one gets the summation of all these guys here, uh, weighed by this coefficient that is stored in this connection, which is again, then stored later in this matrix over here, right? And then we apply possibly a nonlinear function. As you can tell, there are too many connections. There is a huge uh, amount of computations. Uh, given now that we know that natural signals have this specific type of properties, the three properties, which are typed down on the chat. We repeat them a few times. Help me reminder, remind them. What do we have? There are three properties. We mentioned these like seven times or 10 times so far. Tell me, type in the chat. No. Okay. Locality. Second one is. The fact that things happen over again in the same manner, it's called stationarity. And then the third one was the one I show you right now. The fact that the meaning overall comes from this compositionality, this hierarchical combination of individual stimuli. stimuli. Okay. So now we're going to be combining uh, or exploiting these properties in order to introduce some inductive bias in the architecture in order to be able to remove computations and speed up convergence of the learning algorithm. Okay. And so now we're going to see how locality can induce sparsity or, you know, we can use sparsity given that our signal is local. What does it mean? So in this case, uh, I have the pink layer and my input layer is going to be the layer L minus one. Then I have my layer L and then, you know, the following one is going to be the L plus one. And then when we have, you know, the fully connected layer, we have that each input is weighed by this coefficient storing this connection. So we have here five connections, right? Uh, we have five connections. We have uh, 10 connections. Overall, we have 15 connections. And then on the other side, we have, uh, yeah, so here's our 15. And then on the other side, at layer eight plus one, we're going to have three more, right? So we're going to have, um, uh, what, uh, <laughs> this total amount of connections, right? 18 connections. So I cannot, I cannot count in English. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, but now. We know that on the other on the other side, our our signal is local, right? So the information is just present in a specific region of the domain, right? So the domain in here is one, and it goes in this direction. So this neuron over here, it just cares about checking for patterns that are happening within a small region here. We don't really care to know what happens here or here, because the further you go away. And the less relevant these uh, neurons are, these 
pixels or samples or whatever you want to call them, voxels, right? And so the first part is going to be, oh, I'm going to just use three connections, right? So just look for specific patterns there. For the second neuron, I'm going to just look at three patterns over there. For the third neuron, the same. And so here we have nine connections. On the right hand side, we still have those three connections. So in total, again, we have 12 rather than 18. OK, OK. Uh, if you increase the number of neurons, you're going to see how these numbers you know, increase and how they compare. As you move from the left hand side to the right hand side, you go high in the hierarchical view. So these networks are usually drawn or left to, to right in this case, or actually I should have just drawn them bottom to top in, since I actually have space here, right? Why do I draw them bottom to top? Because that's how you go up in the hierarchy, right? So the network should be in the same direction where you climb from the, the base, no, where there is the input to the higher level of this higher hierarchy, right? And so I'm going to be defining something now in this RF, the, uh, which is the receptive field. OK. Uh, and so my receptive field here is simply uh, telling you how many neurons my given neuron can see from the previous layer. Right. So in this case, the receptive field for the output neuron with respect to the hidden layer is three. So question for people at home, what is the receptive field? Uh, for the hidden neurons with respect to the input neuron. Type three, okay, that's, that's good. So final question, what is the receptive field of the output neuron with respect to the input? Five, okay. I don't know if you're checking the slides <laughs> in advance or you're just reasoning along with me. I hope you're reasoning with me, okay. Uh, and so the, the more you go to the right, the more you have this global view. And similar, similarly, as you figured before, why five? Because you can count that this body here, this blue one here, can see up to five pink inputs. There you go. Yes. Thank you for answering. Uh, all right. And so again, the in order to actually be able to, let's say, classify the previous images, a uh, face of a lady, you need to have several layers in this case, right? You can't really do it with one layer. Or you can have several layers and then you need to reduce again the number of uh, the information, right? Which we, we, which we can do this, for example, with a pooling. Uh, we're going to see that in a second. Okay, so here, uh, how, are, how is made a neural network, right? So we have two things on neural network we said. Remind me, we saw that last time. We have What's the neural network, neural network made of? Type in the chat. <laughs> yeah, linear layer, but this is my labs, right? W what terms do I use? No, squashing, okay. And the other one was rotation, okay. So we have rotation and squashing. And the, the rotation is simply, you know, a, a fine transformation, like in, in proper jargon, and which is, you know, achieved by doing a matrix multiplication, right? Matrix multiplication plus the displacement, the offset. And so in this case, I just show you that we start with a, with a fully connected layer, no, which is a, a matrix. Uh, but in, in this case, I'm showing you I'm dropping some connections. So these dropping connections simply means writing zeros in correspondence of all the connections uh, that are not existent, right? So in a pre, in a next in a next lesson, I'm going to be actually writing down the math to show you how this works, right? But nevertheless, the convolution is still a matrix multiplication, a linear operation, right? Uh, just with a lot of zeros, and that's when you put a lot of zeros inside a matrix, that's called a sparse matrix. And so that, that's why uh, again, where the, that's where these sparsity terms comes into play. But again, still matrix multiplication, multiplication, still a rotation. Um, and also it need to be a, a rotation in a high dimensional space, right? So these convolutions will have to, you know, rotate your data. And then it just looks at these specific regions and expands them to multiple in, uh, hidden representations, right? But it's just that small region, you cannot take the whole thing. It's too many points, too many, you know, it's a too high dimensional input otherwise. Cool. 
Second part, stationarity, which implies parameter sharing. What does it mean? So in the first case, I show you, uh, we start with these sparse connections on the left hand side where all these arrows are white. Instead, uh, I just show you in with a dashed gray line, the connection we dropped and which are no longer uh, with us. Okay, so those are zero connections. On the right hand side, I'm gonna be drawing the same thing, but in this case, I'm gonna be using colors. So I'm gonna be drawing the first edge in yellow. And so all these ones are gonna be yellows. Similarly, I'm gonna be drawing all horizontal connections with the orange color as like this. Finally, all the final connections are gonna be drawn in red. And so these are gonna be my three colors. So these three colors are basically representing the same weight. So given a neuron here, the neuron that is one up will be always multiplied by the yellow coefficient. So this neuron here uh, has the neuron up one up multiplied by the yellow coefficient. Similarly for this one, okay? So they all share the same parameter, right? That's why it's called parameter sharing. And then I collect all these values, the yellow, orange, and red into this collection, which is called uh, a kernel, okay? So we have first, you know, definition, word of the word kernel. And so parameter sharing allow us to have quite some, several benefits. Uh, first one is faster convergence. Why is that? Because the same way, the same weight actually can be uh, getting gradients from different regions. Before you get, you know, that this specific value here gets gradient only from this location. In this case, you get this yellow one gets gradients from multiple uh, parts. So you have much more information for moving faster the, uh, the, the, the way to the correct, to the best location. You have better generalization because you're not looking for a specific thing that happens in only one location, but you try to find a more general type of pattern that can be used all across the domain. Okay, so doesn't doesn't specify too much for that specific region. Uh, it's not constrained to the input size. This is really important, right? Uh, if you make the input a bit larger, even after training, you already have the weight that can, can be used to tackle that extra part, right? So what happens is that you can train, let's say, a face recognition system on just faces, like my, my, my face here, and then you can apply this on the whole image over here, right? And then you can uh, just apply the convolutional net all across this you know, big image by having it train only on this small type of input data, okay? And there is no, you know, no, no issue with the larger input, larger input, right? Instead, if you consider this big image as just one big vector, then you have no idea how to, you know, tackle the fact that you have more pixels now than what you use for training, right? And so this is something that, you know, is not to be uh, uh, taken, you know, not be forgotten. Finally, the kernels are independent. So if you have multiple kernels, you can compute these convolutions, these, these multiplications, uh, by multiplication, I'm gonna say matrix multiplication, are in parallel, right? They don't share any type of, uh, they, they don't have dependencies. You can compute all of them together. Uh, but here we just saw one kernel. So where are the other kernels? I'll tell you in a second. Uh, the connection sparsity instead basically reduce the amount of computations. Uh, you can implement a convolution with a matrix multiplication, which is, um, which is basically, you know, having a big zeros inside the matrix, but multiplying by a zero, you know, already what's the answer, right? Nevertheless, having the convolution implemented as a matrix multiplication can be, uh, convenient if computation is free uh, to you, right? So let's say um, if you use a, a, a GPU, right, a graphic, graphic card, uh, you have, you know, a given amount of computations you can take, right? Uh, and matrix multiplication are already implemented very well. And if you can take, you know, this larger amount of chunks of memory and you still have that amount of computation, you can just use them with a, uh, classical matrix multiplication, uh, and they're gonna perhaps gonna be even going faster than running, you know, 
the other option that goes, you know, throughout the, the whole thing, right? So in one case, you just do one matrix multiplication, you're going to go faster, uh, but you, it takes a lot of memory as well. The other one is going to be slower, but perhaps it takes less memory. Given that you have a larger budget of, you know, computation, you can still use. Uh, connection sparsity equals tried. No. Connection sparsity means you have zeros in your uh, in your matrix multiplication. So their metrics that you're going to be using has some values set to zero, which are these dashed lines. All right. So we we mentioned before we had uh, kernels. Let, let me go into these kernels a little bit more. So in this case, we said that we have the yellow, orange, red kernel that is applied to the first triad of, of input, then it's going to be applied to the second triad and then the third um, triple, no triad, triple of neurons. Um, and so these one are going to be stored in this collection here. So my kernel in this case has three values, you know, yellow, uh, orange and red, and they are stored in this vector over here. Uh, nevertheless, I may have a second kernel. Okay. And so I have the kernel blue, purple and pink. And so for this specific case, I have two kernels, each of which has length three. Okay. So the kernel, uh, no length, sorry, my bad. The kernel dimensionality is three. It has three items, right? And I have two of them, right? How does it work? So by the fact that I have two kernels, by running the first kernel, I'm going to get the first set of outputs. By running the second kernel, I will have the second number of outputs. And so you can think about these neurons over here. Oh, my bad. But you can think about these neurons here as having two layers, the one on the, on the screen and then one layer up out of the screen, right? So you have one, this is the, on the screen. The, the when you apply the first kernel, you have the first output. And then you apply the second kernel, you're going to have the second output on top, right? And so in this case, we move perhaps from a mono type of signal, if these pink guys have only one value, to a stereo <laughs> type of, you know, hidden layer, okay? But in this case, instead, my input, it's a seven dimensional, uh, it has seven channels, right? So each, uh, each pink circle here, are basically seven stuck circles, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So there are seven uh, circles, one on top of each other. Uh, don't write private messages. I cannot see them. Just write to the uh, public chat. So also the TAs can answer. Uh, so you have seven inputs. So, so sorry, you have seven uh, channels in the input. And then with two kernels, we, you will have a two dimensional output, right? Uh, usually, if you are going to be using a stereophonic uh, type of signal, you're going to have just two channels in the input, and then perhaps you want to bump these to 16, uh, let's say, intermediate um, uh, channels for the for the hidden layer, right? So you want to usually up sample, right? You want to go, sorry, up sample. You want to go in a higher dimensional space when you move to the hidden layer, such that things are easy to move, as we mentioned a few times already. Okay, I'm talking too much. So the fact that these um, input are seven dimensional, like the, 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 basically the channels are seven. This means that this yellow item over here, it also has seven components. Okay. So the yellow star, the orange star and the red stars, all of these are three are, are seven dimensional vectors. Okay. Again, coming out from the screen such that I can perform the dot product, the, the scalar product between this and the input. All right, so my kernel size are gonna be the following. So I have two kernels, you can see over here, of which each element inside of the kernel has seven dimensions, and this is the seven over here. And then overall, I have three, you know, three items in this kernel, one, two, and three, right? So it has to be seven, it has to match this dimensionality such that each value in the, in the vector input is, has its own coefficient. And then the three is the actual length or well, the actual span of this uh, kernel, right? How much the, the actual dimensionality of it. I don't consider seven as the dimensionality. Three is the, the, the so the three is how, 
how much you cover of the domain, right? So the three is going to be telling you, you cover three samples of the domain. And seven has to be uh, the number of channels matching the whatever source, right? You have to be able to weigh each uh, channel with its own coefficient. So seven is given to you by the previous layer, which is, again, the, the number of channels of the previous layer. Three is going to be the, uh, the how many components you basically want to consider in your domain. So this is a parameter that depends on, on, depends on the uh, locality of, of the signal, right? So if you have signals that are more spread, you want, you want to have a larger number uh, over here, right? Such that you can, you know, check for larger type of signals, right? Larger, uh, more extended type of signals. Number two here is how many uh, channels the next layer will have, right? Okay. So in this case, one dimensional data uses 3D kernels collections, right? So 1D data, because it goes only in the domain is one dimensional, right? It has these kernels which have three dimensions, number of kernels, the number of channels, the uh, extension in terms of uh, domain. Padding. So what is padding? Padding is necessary <clears throat> when you want to actually have the same dimension across the network, even though you apply a convolution. As you can tell here, I apply a convolution with a size uh, three. In this case, the size is again the domain size. <clears throat> you have that you have a reduction of the output due to this fact, the fact that, you know, you apply this convolution. And so the reduction is going to be equal to the size uh, of this kernel minus one, right? So the size is three and therefore you have one is missing over here, one is missing over here. Okay, you can see this, right? Uh, so, how much do we need to pad? We need to pad one extra, uh, one extra thing here and one extra imp uh, thing here. And how do we get there? So, you you number of zero padding, it actually is equal to the number of kernels minus one. And then we're going to be doing half of it on one side, usually one half on the other side. Usually that's why we like to have uh, odd numbers for the uh, length, for, for the, the extension on the, on the domain, right? So for this number here. Also, the other uh, the reason to have the odd number is that a given neuron corresponds to a given location. If you have an even, even number of uh, uh, edges here, you're going to have that one neuron corresponds to two. And so you're going to have some blurring factor here. You can also just copy the information over right to the same location. And so we need one extra input per side. And so I'm going to be inputting a zero there and a zero over there such that now I can perform a convolution there and I get one extra there and an extra there such that now the number of neurons in the hidden layer are the same as the neurons in the input layer. And this is helpful for, you know, not getting crazy with varying size of the network. But arguably stupid because you insert, you know, uh, some zero information on the edge, which was not there, right? So we add something. All right, so how do we actually use, uh, uh, can we use different type of padding? Yes, you can do that, uh, but usually you're going to be uh, having zero mean, right? Anyway, and so a zero is a good value to, to use for these edges, right? So you usually with zero mean the, the, the input and you divide by the standard deviation. Also, whenever you use like the uh, batch norm or layer norm, you're going to be always having the, the average value is going to be zero for each layer, right? So adding a zero is not too bad. Uh, by convention, each kernel uh, with one channel will have an odd size due to this. Uh, but any any so the we like to have uh, odd numbers of you know extension such that there is going to be a central location, right? If you have an even number, there is no central location, and that create can create blur blurring effects. So here is a little bit of a practical uh, you know suggestion about how to use these convolutions. 
which is going to be uh, represented in this diagram. So you want to have multiple layers such that you can create this hierarchical uh, you know, structure of convolutions, which are these rotations, uh, nonlinearity, which are the squashing. Uh, we have perhaps to use some pooling factor right, in order to reduce what is the spatial dimensionality. Uh, and then batch normalization, it's something that was, I mean, it's been introduced and now it works like magic, basically it allows us to actually train very long networks without having uh, issues in convergence. Uh, we also found out that residual bypass connections are really important in order to get, you know, a network to train very well, even if it's very, very deep. And so what the network does is basically converting this input, which is very, very flat in this case, no? So it has the, the thickness is very, is very tiny, but the information is a spatial information, right? This, the information is distributed across the, the domain. <clears throat> And so I usually call the thickness as uh, the information on the thickness as characteristic information. So a given location has a specific characteristic. In this case, what is the characteristic information of a given location in this pink image here? So what, what do you know about the specific location? You know the color, right? So the RGB is the specific characteristic information of that location, uh, the specific pixel. On the other side, at the end of the network, let's say we do classification, we have just one big vector. And all of it is characteristic information. There is no more domain, right? We just collapse everything in one specific thing. <laughs> uh, and then the given location in the, in, the, in the actual across the vector is gonna tell you, you know, this is a hippopotamus uh, versus a giraffe. And in, the, in between you have basically a tensor, uh, whatever size that is, you know, a midway between very thin to very long. So the network basically changes the size. You have like a reduction of the domain information, and then I increase in this, you know, a characteristic uh, inform uh, information. Uh, pooling, that is the last part. Then we're going to be covering the, the notebook. Basically, we start here with an edge of this, in, uh, in this case, a two-dimensional signal. And we have a also, it's called kernel, which is the area where we look at. In this case, I have an even number of items. And so I look at what is you know, a possible um, you know, operation that is summarizing the content. And for example, I can use the uh, LP pooling in this case, whenever I consider the P norm. And, or I can consider the max pooling if I consider like P goes to plus infinity, right? And so I, I apply this LP norm, which is again, condense the information, or if I use max actually throws away information more or less, and then you get one value. And then I apply a stride such that I can decimate the information across the spatial, uh, well, across the domain, right? And so this allows me also to reduce the amount of computations. Similarly, you can do something similar with a strided convolution where the convolution is applied only at you know, jumping uh, intervals, right? And then you don't consider exactly what happens exactly all across the domain. And so in this case, the number of channels stay the same, right? Because you perform only the pooling across the uh, domain, inf uh, domain coordinates, but then we keep the same uh, number of channels. Uh, that was pretty much it for the slides. So in the last 10 minutes, we're gonna be covering the, the notebook. Uh, again, as I was mentioning, I think on the, on the chat or maybe not, I forgot. Uh, we always keep open a terminal where we can, you know, use it, run it, uh, for as a calculator, right? Anyway, so, okay. The bar is in front of my nose again. So let's move the bar. Let's move my face. I cannot move my face. There we go. Okay. Uh, so we go in, uh, work, GitHub, uh, PDL. Okay. And then we do conda act, activate PDL. Um, and then we do, uh, Jupyter notebook. Okay. And so right now we're going to be looking at the um, 
convolutional net, right? So just for sake of, uh, we say switch PyTorch deep learning, set kernel. So I'm gonna just execute everything. And then I'm gonna be commenting uh, while my computer is running. Okay. So what do we do in this kind of uh, notebook here? Let me go full screen. Okay, there we go. And let me zoom in. Mm, okay. <clears throat> so here we implode some plotting libraries and we set some default visualization uh, things, right? Uh, import torch and then we port the NN package. Also, I import some other data set and then uh, pyplot as PLT. Here I just have some handling function like helper functions and we set the device to be whatever is available on the current platform. I have a GP, uh, CPU in this case. Here I load the mnist dataset. Uh, this is the modif modified NIST, uh, which Jan modified back uh, 30, 30 years ago. Um, and then we apply some normalization, which are uh, computed across the whole training set. So these are going to be the uh, the mean, and then we divide basically by the standard deviation. Uh, here we have that I'm going to be plotting you 10 digits, right? And so here are, I'm showing you with yellow numbers that are uh, basically uh, close to one, and then purple numbers that are uh, set to zero, okay? But then since we average uh, like we, we remove the mean, I believe that the, 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 the yellow is going to be plus one and the purple minus one. So in this case, we are going to be using a different type of uh, function, okay? I have like a different type of neural network. Last time we saw that we can use sequential. In this case, we're going to be using the more extended version of the building a neural network. Uh, with, it's more a flexible way of building a neural net. So in this case, I have my class, which is gonna be a fully connected two layer. Uh, and then I have my init, which you're gonna be inputting whatever parameters you want to pass later on. And then I have like, you know, I assign to my internal variable, like input size, the input size, and then I define my network again in this case to be also sequential, but this is defined inside this init function. Afterwards, after this is init, is initialized, I have to define the forward function. And the forward function simply does the following. It gets the input and it reshapes it in a one big long vector because this is a fully connected layer. So it doesn't know exactly how to deal with anything that is not a vector. And then I simply feed my X, my reshaped re review, like right? this one big vector to this network, right? Uh, in, other, in the other case, instead, I use a, a convolutional net uh, and I don't use this uh, sequential, right? So here I have each individual uh, item to be like the uh, separate thing, like the separate uh, module. And so I have a convolutional 2D, convolutional 2D. These are in uh, an end dot uh, package. So I have a capital C, capital C means this is an object. And this means inside there are all the parameters, right? all the weights. Similarly for this and then capital linear. Um, here we are using NN relu and as a you know a object in the NN package. Instead, in this case, since we are gonna be using the extended forward, I have that I send the X through this conv one. And conv has a lowercase in this case because it's just a function, although uh, this one gave us also the weight. And then I get the relu from this f, the functional. And so relu now is just a function that doesn't have weight. So I don't need to use uh, you know, the nn package. So the nn was giving me a module and it's necessary whenever you use the sequential because you had to stack several modules. Here I just apply my function to a given input, right? So here I apply all them one after each other. You can do this or you can just do the uh, sequential, right? Uh, how much time left do we have? Where is the timer? Okay, I don't know the timer. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. So here I'm just uh, creating these two networks such that they have the exact same number of parameters. 
here I have my training loop. Uh, and then what I do is going to be the following. So I may or may not permute my data points. So let's see what's going to be. Uh, I train my data, my, my, my networks here uh, on first the normal data set. And then I try to change the order of the pixels just to see what's going to be. So we out of time. Okay. I'm finishing up. So I'm training here the small fully connected layer and the number of parameters are 6,000 and we get 96% on the training set and then 87 on the test set. Then I train my convolutional net on the same number, uh, on the same type of uh, data. And we get, we also have the same number of parameters, right? 6442, here we have 6422 is similar, right? And then we get 95, right? So we can see here how the convolutional network has a better, um, you know, uh, accuracy on the test set than the uh, fully connected layer. But then here, I'm gonna be shuffling the pixels. And so I just take all the pixels and I apply in a deterministic uh, transformation. Whenever I apply a deterministic transformation, I get the following, right? So instead of having this type of five, it, the five is gonna be look like this, instead of having a zero that looks like this, I'm gonna have a zero that looks like this, okay? The four looks like this, the one looks like this. Cool, so now I train the comnet on this shuffle data. And so we went down from 95 to 83, why is that? Because now there is no more uh, local information, right? Because we completely screw up the, the type of data. Instead, if I train the fully connected layer on the same type of data, we, don't, we're, gonna, we're not gonna be observing such, uh, you know, worse performance. You see 85 here. And before we also noticed that was what? 87, okay? This is just statistical variations. And so if we put all together and we see how the cumulative, you know, how the, thing, the two things compare, we have the following. Let me unzoom a little. So the fully connected layer before was, you know, performing this this much well. The convolutional uh, convolutional net was performing much better. Now, after scrambling the pixel order, we have that the convolutional network performs much, much, much worse. And then the other one should be basically should be performing roughly the same as before, right? There, there should there is no major. There are no differences for the for the normal neural net. Okay, uh, why has the normal the neural net reduced? It because of statistical uh, you know variations in the initialization of the parameters. Uh, if you would have, you can try again. Might be this one can be better than the first one. So the the fully connected layer doesn't see any type of difference, and the variations you get are simply the normal expected variations on in performance that you may get when you run multiple times uh, the same training procedure by, by, by using the different type of um, different initial initializations, right? Uh, so this is just due to statistical, you know, fluctuations. Instead, in this case, the neural, the, the convolutional net really drastically lost uh, performance due to the fact that, you know, those little kernels cannot really look uh, at things that have been, you know, move around. So there is no more way of extracting information given that like, okay, there is some information still extracted because we have several layers, uh, but nevertheless, the kernels are less effective, right? Because they have a limited view and then we move pixels away. And so there is no more uh, way to capture that kind of uh, information. And that was pretty much everything uh, I want to tell you uh, about convolutional network for today. So tomorrow we meet and uh, same time, 9.30, and we're gonna be talking about a recurrent neural network. And these two lessons are gonna be, I think, quite helpful for the, um, for the homework that is gonna come in out uh, tomorrow, okay? I think that was it. If you have more questions, uh, ask them on Campus Wire. We will uh, answer every question you have. I was not checking the chat for the last few minutes such that I don't waste too much of your time, okay? All right, see you tomorrow. You have a nice day. Bye.